And today we begin our schedule with John Andrews okay, from New Jersey, who has a deep interest in uh, Middle Eastern history and has presented at annual, annual NAVA meetings in the recent past. He is last year's winner of the Driver Award for Best Paper at an annual meeting. And today he's presenting his paper on the flags of William Shakespeare. John, over to you. So spoiler alert, I don't know what the flags of William Shakespeare look like. No, no one does, right? Probably. This comes out of the interest meetings. Uh, this was a flags and fiction interest meeting that we met online. We had, I think, two of them. Uh, one was um, one was more popularly received than the other one. I, we just kind of talked, and this this topic came out of me just sitting there and saying, I have no idea. I think there are some flags in William Shakespeare. And it converted into this like mini workshop online. We went in a database. We kind of started to talk about it. There was, I think there was like 10 people there. Ted, Ted was there. Um, and it, it started to gain life, right? And, and it, it got big. The idea was, could I find flags in William Shakespeare that indicated to us, using a text, not a picture, where we could find flags in larger data sets later on, okay? So if I have a set of books, all right, and if I want to talk about the flags of Leo Tolstoy or something like that, what were these writers who were writing to an audience in the past, how did they perceive flags? How did they write about them? How did they indicate them to us? This is, these are two paintings um, that were prepared for a, a Shakespeare museum in England. It went, it went defunct, but it produced a number of paintings. This one here on the left comes from uh, a scene, the, uh, one of the scenes in Henry IV, part two. This is called The Rebuke of Falstaff. This guy here is John Falstaff. He was a, a, a very popular character in Shakespeare's day. He's not really so popular anymore. In the back, we have a flag. This here scene comes, this is come, this is from uh, Richard II, Richard II here. He's kind of like this emo prince and king in, in, in Shakespeare, and he, he's more of a poet type thing. Now, in this version here, the, the, art, the artist has indicated a flag in the back. Same thing here. We have an English flag of, of sorts, and there's probably like a, a French and English flag here that I don't know what that, that flag is called, but that's something. The fun fact is, is that this one here has a stage direction. We know when Shakespeare meant a flag. This one doesn't. This, this scene has no, no mentions in it in flags whatsoever, right? So we are aware, at least on some level, that people have conceptualized, to a certain extent, that sometimes in Shakespeare there were flags, sometimes there weren't. This is, this is Henry V. This is another use of it. And this is Lawrence Olivier, later in the 50s ones. In this, we get a line about flags. How did Shakespeare perceive it? In this one, this is after the Battle of Agincourt in 1415. This is, this is Henry going out onto the field and saying, I know there are X number of people that died because I can count their flags on the ground. These are the personal standards of knights and princes that are dead. Here we have Iago, who's like the super villain of all of Shakespeare. All right. Iago's job, he's an ancient, which means he's an ensign. He's a flag bearer. All right. We don't know what the flag he carries. Iago doesn't walk on stage with a flag or anything like that. But the action of Othello is driven out of Iago's animus towards being a low rank and being passed over for promotion. He resents being a flag bearer. This guy's here's ancient pistol. He's kind of like a, a, a bumbling coward. He's also an ancient, but he's pretty loyal, all right, to, to Henry and to Falstaff. Here's another flag related line in Shakespeare ancient pistol. My, how now, mine host, ancient pistol. That's his wife there, too. Here's from Mary Wives of Windsor. It's a Shakespeare rom com, essentially, right? Um, we have another flag reference here. I must advance the colors of my love, all right? A lot of times in Shakespeare, when we have flag use of, of in comedies and romance, it's almost always about moving forward with a romantic pursuit. Happens again in, in Love's Labor Loss. Um, yeah, that's Doctor Who, right? We had Obi Wan, and now we have Doctor Who, too. Um, Love's labor loss, long story short, four guys go on a vacation to like meditate and study and they end up chasing girls the entire time, right? That's, that's basically it. Works out fine. Uh, you'll, you'll notice I came of age in the 90s because I have Leo here. This is from Act 5, Romeo and Juliet. 
Romeo goes to the tomb. He thinks Juliet's dead. He's going to commit suicide. And he just starts talking about flags. It's very, it's a very strange thing to do before you commit suicide. Uh, beauty's ensign, death's pale flag. He's talking about Juliet's body is, is, is still beautiful. And it's almost like she's not dead, right? All right, so what, right? This is all cool. It's very interesting. All right, I got it. We like flags. We're here in Florida. What, what, what is the point of all this? What would be the, the purpose of looking into the flags of William Shakespeare? Well, I'm glad you asked. That's why we're here, right? Okay, so first and foremost, this idea is to, to form a test bed of a larger primary source analysis, right? If you wanted to analyze a primary source that had a definitive beginning and end, this is a way you could do it without scouring the archives for flags. Any of us that done archival research before, like, oh, I got to find flag A, and you go through all these documents and you go, man, I really regret this decision. It's just, just not there. People don't draw. It's very, very rare to have pictures draw flags. So we don't know what they look like, but we know that they do exist, right? And that, that's, that is very key. Number two is you will never go wrong studying Shakespeare. You will never go wrong studying humanities. If you think the humanities are in trouble right now, you think the humanities have intrinsic value that's being forgotten about, this is a great pursuit. We're taking the universal human experience. We're taking flags as universal objects. We're putting them together. It's great, right? What, how, how could we go wrong? Shakespeare in particularly, all right, this gives us a primary, a reason. We can provide research for vexillologists, opportunity to find flags within primary records. We said that. The good news about Shakespeare's work is that if you're looking at a primary source collection, it needs to be large enough to find specific instances. Okay, so like the flags of Star Wars will probably disappoint you, all right? Like they're, 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 they're not going to be there, all right? It, the, Shakespeare is about 500, 600,000 words. It's also about the length of War and Peace. They have almost about the same amount of flags. War and Peace has got like 110 flag references in it, all right? The other good thing about Shakespeare, what it does for us, is he writes during a period of tremendous transformation in English history. 1590s are a period of relative peace, a period of relative prosperity. And what did English men and English women during those times, how did they perceive these objects? How did Shakespeare write about them? This is Edwin Booth. Uh, his brother assassinated Abraham Lincoln five years prior to this, and it didn't hurt his career. This is him as Iago, as the universal villain. And we can also do this, you know, last and foremost to say, what were flags, how were they perceived in the, the 16th and the 17th century? So uh, my original idea behind this was to take and show you this absolutely horrendous uh, Excel spreadsheet, and we would go box by box, and I would show it to you. I, I opted to go a different way, all right? So... <laughs> It's Sunday, right? We, we're just trying to, you know, just trying, to get, trying to get through it. Okay, so basically what I did is, is I organized my research. I went out and found these instances of flags in Shakespeare, and I'm going to show you how I organized them because organization is actually the key on, on a project like this or just this project in general. So uh, the original data set crashed. It was lost, um, and when I, when I put it back together, I came up with this system here. This is super boring, but also important. This administrative data and, and, and uh, identification. I had to give every instance a group, like a neighborhood that it belonged to, and then a specific home that it belonged to. So every instance has got a vexillological, vexillological group that it belongs to, vex group. It has a serial number going from V0001 to V0104 right now. There's 104 of these things, right? So every specific instance is coded, it's identified, and it's different from its neighbor. There's also potential for a heraldic group, heraldry group. I found some heraldry stuff. It's, it's currently just being kind of put off uh, to the side, and, and it will probably someday form a group. So the admin data, like I said, there's currently 104 of these things um, in 104 items, and we got one in heraldry group. There are probably many, many, many more. The real fear is that there might be several times more, right? and that flags will become a... a, a a smaller group than in a, in a study of these items. So we also sorted by keyword and title. We have a keyword, a word like flag, and we have a show or, or, or a title that it corresponds to. Keyword searches that didn't work before we talk about the ones that didn't. Uh, Banderole, Guidon, Jack, Pennant, Vexillum, unfortunately. All right? these, are, these are words that are either not in use then or will be in use later. Jack is a really good example. Jack is loaded in Shakespeare. Just, we just don't mean, he doesn't mean that Jack. All right? Words that did work, ancient, banner, banneret, colors, ensign, flag, standard, streamer, and pennon. All, right? all of these had instances in Shakespeare when we searched them. 
Positive search, these are on the numbers, colors, 40, ancient, you can read all these here. Going all down to things that are seemed less important, streamer, banneret. Banneret is just like a really, really tiny flag. Um, in Shakespeare, it's, it's shown as someone who's like not sincere, he's kind of like a dude ads kind of thing. This is search results, how they came out. You'll note that colors is by far the, the, the most, the biggest, and that's, that's because it's largely used in stage directions. Titles that did not um, result in any kind of search, Merchant of Venice, Twelfth Night, Henry VIII. The reason is usually these are flags. These are usually plays that have to do with social issues or comedies and things like that. The, the flags and, and warfare is not really applicable. Most of the time, more often than not, Shakespeare, when he's talking about flags, he's talking about warfare, almost always. And we see that in these results here, most of these most of these plays that pop out have a, if it does not have a direct conflict in, in English history where two kings are fighting each other or something like that, it has a tragedy about a military figure, right? Coriolanus is not a history, it's a tragedy, but it still has warfare in it, right? That, that kind of thing. Same thing with Hamlet, same thing with Macbeth. We did a, I did a word cloud here of my titles, the ones that stuck out the most. Henry, Parr, King, these are all histories. These are things that are ab about English history. Richard, two, three, four, okay, et cetera, et cetera. Othello is the, uh, is the outlier through the word ancient. Othello is so bad that they talk about him constantly, or Iago is constantly talking about him, that it just comes up all the time. And it's one of these things that did throw the data set, but we're kind of stuck with it. Um, there's context. I, I put, I picked four contexts. Originally, there was like six or seven. They got radi radically out of control. A military context, a social context, political and poetic. Again, military being um, by far the most. Stage directions with armies coming in. Put your colors on the rampart. Uh, uh, strike the standard. That that kind of stuff. Right. It is almost always military. The poetic stuff I think is kind of cool. All right. Um, in context. Uh, we had genres where history is again majority tragedies comedies and then as it as it got as it, it got less if it, if it resulted in a likelihood that a play would be not about warfare or conflict it, it almost never happened it's poems and, and the poems and narrative poems and romances again were almost always about motion going forward in some kind of romantic pursuit uh, comedy is yeah, military metaphors okay Great. Uh, literal and symbolic. Are we talking about literal flags like I see the enemy's flags approaching or is someone saying, um, you know, you know, these bloodied flags or something like that, a, a stain on someone's family or something like that. More often than not, we're talking about literal flags. And this is almost always because of stage directions. Someone just walks on stage with a flag. Okay, who said that? Okay, settings. Um, I, I, I sorted by settings. Medieval settings were by far the most early modern, and then antiquity it was a blend of those. Almost always it had to do with either the Wars of Roses, Tudor's Ascendancy, or some kind of civil wars that were going on in the medieval period in England. Our two political dynasties, we divided these. We have Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth and uh, James I. Um, they were both very important to Shakespeare, James more than, more than uh, Elizabeth. And James was Shakespeare's biggest patron to the later part of his career. Um, we left a lot of other things, we left them on not here, but other things we considered the acts, scenes that occurred in, were the men, women, uh, uh, translations. There were a lot of other data that doesn't really make sense to hear and it won't be crunchable in, in, until later on. So if we're curious, how do we do this? How do we find flags in Shakespeare? Give you a two second pitch because I know we are running out of time. Okay, so first you're gonna need some words, okay? Words are in dictionaries, all right? But do yourself a favor, conduct the Oxford English Dictionary. You can find a paper copy in your library at the second edition or the third edition, which is available online. If you have access to an academic library, you can get that, you can just get online. Most of your public libraries have access. Oxford English Dictionary involves a consistent use of these words, and it's linked to other words to a historical thesaurus. Example keywords, again, these are some of the ones we used. Next, you're going to go to a database, a consistent database. I use the Folger Shakespeare Library database. This one was the best one to use. I'd put in banner, I would get banner, and then I would look at banner. Or in this case, banner, right? And I would say an idea, is this the banner we're talking about? Because if I put flag and I get flag on, which is like a, a, a cup you put wine in it, or like a <laughs> rowdy party or something like that, that's not the flag we mean. So you still have to go through and weed these things. Once you do, you get an idea. 
You may want to go to a reputable conversion source. I use I use uh, lit charts, which you can also use No Fear Shakespeare, and just compare. Okay, unwind your bloody flag. Maybe that's some weird Shakespeare thing. Nope, blood covered battle flag. Okay, that's the one he means. All right, you look into that one, and then you just start writing it down. Yes, I have found a flag in Shakespeare. I found a word in English. It is in the proper context. I cross referenced it in a database, and I confirmed it with a secondary literature that says, indeed, yes, that is a flat. So going forward, we've got some problems, actually a, a, a lot of them, all right? This data set is, is just, again, just a concept, right? It's not actual, a, a, a data crunchable data set yet. I love that picture. It's, I think that's Macbeth, Hamlet, one of those guys. Okay, and that's from Shakespeare in Love. That's not even an actual Shakespeare play. Okay, so these are the problems. Should we put heraldry in this? Yes or no? If we say yes, this could very quickly just become heraldry, heraldry is the boss and flags are the little bit. Because if we know anything about our vexillological history, we'll know that things like livery and colors and ensigns and not ensigns and uh, escutcheons and all these other words that are in Shakespeare will probably number more than 104. All right. So the flags of William Shakespeare will very quickly become uh, symbolism in William Shakespeare. We'll, we'll eventually, we'll get away from flags very, very quick. How should allusions to flags, we're not literally saying flags, right? Um, in Henry V, he calls a flag these bloody curtains, right? He means flags, right? Like he, that, that, that's definitely translated to be that. How is that coded and tabulated, right? That's a, that's a serious answer that's going to, that's a serious problem going forward that is going to be tough to untangle. Last but not least, as anything with data today, it will need to be coded into an actual data project, right? It just me on a back piece of paper saying 48% of the time or something like that, or using the pie chart or whatever, will not develop a relationship between all these data points. It will only show us in the, in the broadest sense. So eventually it's going to need to be a coding project, either using all the R programming language or the Python programming language. Make a long story short, these are programming languages that do statistics, all right? Which is like very, very, very important if we're going to do data analysis. Right now, I have about 2,000 data points with this project. My goal eventually is to do the record of the rebellion, which is, which is the 130 volume official records of American Civil War dispatches. That, that could produce 50,000 data points. Maybe. It might even be 100,000. I, I don't, I have no idea. So getting it right from the set, from the start, and writing this stuff in a way that a computer and a machine can later on do the statistical analysis on it, if, we don't, if I don't do that now, going down the line, this will just be a very interesting collection of anecdotes about William Shakespeare, and it will not be actionable in any real way. Conclusion, I feel like that. I'm sure you do too, okay? Like, it's been tough, all right? If, if you went to Castillo, I slept in today, but... I love, man, I, I said, I'm the 90s. I love Kenneth Branagh. Like, I, I don't, I, I just, this is just the best. Okay, so takeaways. At least you need to know this is a digital humanities project, all right, attempting to quantify flags in primary sources. I use Shakespeare, but it doesn't need to be Shakespeare. Um, it uses a database to ensure consistent sources, all right, so we're using, doing things in a consistent way. And while the work is, I can't remember what I wrote. Okay, yeah. So while Shakespeare is intrinsically valuable and it's a great thing, it still has, it has a, uh, applicability to us as vexillologists, vexillologists and, and can do vexillological research. Ah, that's Joan of Arc. She's like a villain in Shakespeare. That's a thing too. A lot of times you miss that. And that's my talk. Thank you. Okay, questions. Steve. Now, I'm really sad, but I it. What does the word ancient mean? Okay, so ancient in Shakespeare can mean very, very, very old. All right, so there are 86 instances of, of ancient. Uh, Steve wanted to know what the word ancient means for us in Zoom land. Um, ancient, ancient it seems to be an older derivation of ensign. So it, it's, it, it's like a rank. So like false staff will say, I have ancients, corporals, lieutenants, captains, something like that. It's like a very low ranking officer. That's basically what it means. I think it does literally mean the guy who follows the knight around with the knight's flag. That's, that's, what, I, that's what I think it is. Yes. There, there's a couple, yeah, I, I don't know how it became like that and it, it, what it looks like in the actual Shakespeare, because the database that I use actually converts it to common English. So colors becomes colors like, like, like in America. You threw out the colors, which is part of the lexicon, I gave it 110 flag references, and 
boring days. So I was like, did you do a larger uh, beyond Shakespeare? No, I, I, I just back of the envelope, like mid in this, I was like, okay, I got a PDF of War and Peace and started hitting control F on it and just, just very quick tabulated. Like, um, there are no flags in the Iliad and the Odyssey. Very few, you know, that there are almost no references to that. I find it very hard to believe that a Greek army did not have some kind of battle flag, but it's just not there. Uh, we have a question from Scott Mayberry um, uh, coming up from Zoom. What role do you see for qualitative methods as opposed to coding and stats? So I, I think, I think the, I think the, with respect to qualitative methods, I think the, I think the thing that, I think where we come in as vexillologists is being made judgment calls ab about what it is we mean when we say flags. And it, did I answer his question? Did, did, is, is that what he's... There's another question from someone else. But just, just with respect to it, I, I think, I think the, the qualitative stuff is going to come on the backside of this. So when we have data and we say, you know, um, 95% of the flag actions in Shakespeare have to do with men. What are those 5% remaining 5% are they significant and why that is not a qualitative. That's not a quantitative answer. That's a qualitative answer. That's a judgment call as both a historian and vexillologist that we have to make. And uh, we also have one from Steve Wheatley. Will the database eventually be accessible publicly? Yes, currently it, it exists as a ex Excel spreadsheet. It will likely have its own life online as a dedicated URL. <laughs> uh, hang on just a second. Take like from the young lady in the back. Yeah, did you, um, in pulling up everything, did you take into consideration um, whether he was like the first folio or the so my understanding, my understanding is this is all first folio stuff. Oh, I'm sorry. So the, the question is, when Shakespeare dies, it'll, all his stuff doesn't exist, right? So the, the people that come after him in 1623 put this thing together, which is sometimes known as the first folio, wasn't wasn't published as that. The first folio forms the, the database of the first, the first, what we think of as Shakespeare and then evolves into second and third folio. That That's what you mean. My understanding is that and I have to get back to this, Folger Shakespeare Library is first folio. Because when they say Shakespeare, it's, it's, it's strange. It's, it is not the, the folio and the database. Sometimes they, they, don't, they don't match up. And if, I'm, if ever I was curious about something, I went to the actual first folio. Folio 86, I think, is the one that's available. And I would actually go to the scene and look it up. And I, I had to do that like two or three times. I think that... Uh Jonathan's quick in Elbridge Travel is the word ancient to mean a ship's in sea, flown at sea. Okay. And uh, from your reading, do you think Shakespeare knew a lot about Elbridge? I, I think I think so. With uh, the question is, does Shakespeare know a lot about heraldry? I think so. Are you sailing or herald heraldry? Well, of course, heraldry was what you by the so that's it that's that's one on the authorship question um so it's, it seems that most people within the life of William Shakespeare thought he wrote this stuff. Um, he's dead. People that loved him and cared about him thought to collect his works and to put it together and to put his name on it. Um, it is certainly true to say that Shakespeare did not write all of his works. He worked collaboration, very famous with a guy named John Fletcher. Um, it is very difficult sometimes, for example, in, in Henry VIII, to know where Fletcher begins and Shakespeare, Shakespeare does. Um, Shakespeare authorship is a, more of a 19th century thing. If we found out that Shakespeare didn't write this stuff, I don't know that it would materially change it because it's still a collection of words that were known to a, an Elizabethan and Jacobean author, uh, audience at the time. As long as it has a definitive beginning and end, I mean, you could do the Bible, you could do flags of the Bible, and that certainly does not have you know, one author. Um, it would be interesting, but I'm not 100% sure that it, it, would, it would blow it up entirely. You definitely have to go back and look at it. 
Do we have time? I have one more. Um, we have one more question from online. Oh, and as well as a quick comment. How many of them were specific flags? For example, the flag of England. There is not a there is not a specific reference to any to any actual flag. And uh, Scott May Waring had a comment. A great presentation, John. Textual analysis is a new frontier of <laughs> That's great. I take that as a great compliment. 